great piece of advice and I, I'll certainly use that myself Professor thank you <laughs> now I think something I've always wanted to ask you is do you have an all-time favorite historical figure and if so who are they and what draws you to them well I don't like the word favorite oh, okay um, why not well the trouble is when our first son was born yes. at, at the University of Sydney, all the students uh, demanded that he be called Augustus. <laughs> and, um, uh, oh, that's my fantastic. wife and I refused this. But it was, I can't imagine why. Well, this is the problem. So people think you have favourites. Yes. And I've spent all my life being deeply interested in Augustus. In yes. fact, I know the year it began. Okay. 1949. 1949. And here I am, 51 years or whatever that is, <laughs> 61 years on, and I still can't let the, the figure go. But oh. I, I don't want to call him my favourite. Okay. He is a compellingly interesting person whom okay. I actually dislike. Okay. But I'm not against him. Okay. I'm trying to find out what he actually thought he was doing. Everybody else thinks they know what he was doing. Yeah. But I think everybody else is wrong. Okay. They've never really sufficiently teased out what he thought he was doing. And I'm not doing that because I like him. Mm -hmm. So he's not a favourite, mm -hmm. but he's a, he's a dominant interest. Absolutely. The other one would be Paul of Tarsus, and I don't want to say I, I like him either particularly. Okay. I'm deeply interested in him for an entirely different reason. Okay. I mean, I'm interested in him because he... Whereas the puzzle with Augustus is to work out exactly what he thought he was doing, mm -hmm. it's rather blindingly apparent uh, in Paul's letters in the sense that he exposes himself. One wouldn't exactly say that Augustus exposes himself. He, he presents himself, of course, mm -hmm. um, but that can be uh, indeed the classical... Um, picture of Augustus is, is a man behind a facade. I actually think that's wrong. But what is certainly right about Paul of Tarsus is that he he looks inside and doesn't like what he sees and can't explain it. He can't explain himself. Wow. But he um, that had never really been done in classical thought. It, it is a deep breakthrough yes. in our cultural tradition at that precise point. And we have the actual letters yeah. that he wrote saying, uh, in effect, uh, what a battle he's mm. having to understand himself because of the catastrophic career experiences he had. Okay. And uh, very much of the uh, um, passionate interest in the inner person that our culture operates on passions in particular. Yes. That doesn't come from our classical side, mm. which was dispassionate. Mm. Um, it, it comes from the, the burning problem of what you see within that you don't like. Yes. But everything that, that we find interesting in each other uh, concerns these inner problems. What's what all novels are about, mm. for example. Novels aren't classical. Mm. That's why they're called novel. Mm. It was a, it was a, a new way of um, thinking yes. about human experience. Exploring ideas. Yeah, but we all take it for granted, indeed, the development of psychology and brain science, for that matter, is, um, uh, is forever emphasizing the, the primacy of, of the subconscious. Absolutely. But Paul is a pivotal figure in opening that up. Yeah, and I like how for both of these figures, for Alexander and for Paul of Tarsus, that I suppose what draws you to them are elements of the cognitive and the reflexive. And I, I love the idea that you can see ancient history as a means to access these particular aspects well, yes, of the, individuals the, in ancient culture. The reason why they're interesting, of course, and it wasn't Alexander, by the way, I was talking about, that was Augustus. Oh, I, I, but, sorry, please, but, yes. Um, <laughs> the reason why I find them compelling, and, and why I, I think other people do, yeah. uh, and indeed why anybody finds anybody compelling who's along, Yes. who seems ostensibly remote from us, yes. uh, is that we do in fact get close to them. Mm. 
We, we talk to them, yes. though they're 2,000 years gone. I agree. And we hear what they say, and, and we have questions for them. Yes. And it's not different. The, the communicative issue is not different from the one we're having between you and me now. Indeed. Uh, except that um, there's a certain distance. Mm. But the, the cognitive issues are not different. And the certain distance is actually a help. Because particularly when you're a late teenager, um, you don't... Too much proximity to your own problems is itself a problem. Mm. Or at least one time tends to evade it. You go on evading it, of course, but um, um, you see, the thing is, I, I, I'm actually very classical. I don't want to expose myself, and um, I'm guarded and uh, pedantic and so on. But I don't admire that. I don't admire myself. Um, and uh, it's not true. The truth is the, the passionate, unmanageable, in a life. Indeed. But I've forgotten why I'm So conversations with, with yourself and with others. Oh yes, and so what I, what I mean is the, why is ancient history so interesting? Mm. Why do we have favourites allegedly? Yes. It's because it's a, it is an authentic human engagement Indeed. that we're having. Just like the engagements we have with each other, but easier to think about and deal with because of a certain distance. Indeed. It's a liberating distance, actually. Indeed. We're not lost in the past. No. We live in the present. Yes. But it extends our grip yes. on present realities by being able to give and take with this extraordinary figure that commands our attention, Augustus O'Paul. Beautiful, beautiful. Now.